It is therefore time for question period. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks, Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is for the acting premier. It's about the Liberals' latest gas plant scandal. The Ontario Energy Board warned the government in 2009. This was back in 2009 that ratepayers could be built out of millions, and the Liberals did nothing about it. They warned the Liberals again in 2011, and again. The Liberal government did nothing. nothing. Now we know that Goreway wasn't the only gas plant that decided to treat Ontario ratepayers like their own piggy bank. This government tried to hide that for years. Mr. Speaker, this looks like a smokescreen on the part of the government, and it happened under a succession of energy ministers. Both the members from Scarborough Centre and Ottawa West Nepean were ministers of energy during this misappropriation. So, Mr. Speaker, how many Liberals does Question. it take to cover up a $100 million scandal? The member will withdraw. Withdraw. Thank you. Excuse me, without comment. Deputy Premier. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Economic development and growth. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Handling other, another minister's file like this is is kind of like being a grandparent in some ways. I get to handle the file and work with you on this today, and then at the after the weekend, I probably get to hand it back to the minister when I probably had enough of it. So, I, I uh, I'm pleased to be uh, acting on behalf of the Minister of Energy today and. Again, Mr. Speaker, uh, I mean, let's put this all back into perspective. The IESO uh, was made aware of some potential ineligible uh, costs that had been going on within the system. Uh, they fully investigated those costs. They recovered the vast majority of those costs, Mr. Speaker. They levied a $10 million fine, the biggest ever levied in these kinds of circumstances. They posted the report uh, and the record on the OEB website, Mr. Speaker, so it's there for all to see. They've taken steps to ensure yes, that the uh, system's been strengthened so it won't occur again. And, Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll, I'll continue more about what some future actions are going to be Thank in the you. supplementary. supplementary. Speaker, uh, the member opposite was a Minister of Energy when some of this gaming was going on, and his seatmate was also a Minister of Energy while this gaming was going on at Goreway. Speaker, this Goreway natural gas plant got the final draft of the report from the OEB in July. The government got the report in September. It was made public November 2nd. But amazingly, the Goreway executive that was helping write the new electricity market rules didn't resign until last Friday. That was after the Cabinet Office had received their advanced copy of today's report by the Auditor General. Mm. Speaker, if we pulled the phone records for the Energy Ministry and the Cabinet Office for the end of last week, would we find calls to Goreway Power or the IESO pressuring them for a resignation? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, this entire process is conducted as appropriately it should be by the IESO, uh, the Independent elect uh, Electricity uh, uh, Supplier for Ontario or Systems Operator for Ontario. I, I say that because I think a lot of people don't know what the IESO is. Mr. Speaker, their job is to ensure that our electricity system uh, is, is regulated. I might get there quicker. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, th th their job is to ensure that the, the uh, electricity system is properly regulated. They've done that. They're doing that job. They, they found some ineligible costs that, uh, that a company, and in fact, there were some other companies, as the member indicated, that, uh, that may have been here. They've taken action. They've cleaned up the system, Mr. Speaker, strengthened the system to ensure it can occur in the future, and they've recovered the Thank vast you. majority of funds, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Thanks, Speaker. And uh, the member opposite can try and distance himself from this all he wants, but again, he was a Minister of Energy when this gaming was brought to light by the Energy Board, and, and so was his seatmate. Speaker, the, these Liberal scandals have a pattern. 
First, there's the mind-numbing incompetence. Then there's the lack of oversight. We wonder who's minding the store over there when hundreds of millions of dollars are being wasted in this sector. Then there's the clumsy smokescreen that comes up. Then, like a child called into the principal's office, the government minister hangs their head and tells Ontarians how sorry they are. But because no one's ever held accountable over there by the premier or anyone in that government, no one actually learns anything, so the same mistakes continue to occur over and over again. There are two former energy ministers in cabinet who both fell asleep Question. at the switch. No one's minding the store to the acting premier. Why are those ministers still in cabinet? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, I've been pretty forthright in my responses to the member on two consecutive questions, and the member persists on trying to get political with this. So, Mr. Speaker, perhaps I should respond in kind. Let me remind that member, Mr. Speaker, that he's part of a party that better be very careful when they're making allegations of exploitation and gaming. When you look at their tabloid, Mr. Speaker, that they recently put out, talk about gaming people, Mr. Speaker, claiming a 22 per cent income tax cut when it's nothing of the sort, Mr. Speaker. You look at the, that's just a bogus claim. You look further, Mr. Speaker, and you see $12 billion in cuts, none of which are transparent, none of which are defined. Mr. Speaker, what kind of energy programs are they going to cut? What kind of education programs are they going to cut? What kind of health care programs? Mr. Speaker, they're on pretty thin ice over there Answer. when they make those kind of political allegations, if you ask me. Thank you. New question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Citing non existent savings, this government callously cancelled passenger rail service to northeastern Ontario as part of a plan to sell off Ontario Northland. It was only after we called in the Auditor General who revealed there were no savings to be had, and in fact, it would actually cost taxpayers $820 million to sell off Ontario Northland that this government partially halted the sale. Today, Northerners are left without rail service while options in southern Ontario are expanded. Northerners were rightfully furious with the Liberal decision to cancel the service, fearing job losses and the end of an historic transportation option to and from Toronto Question. for medical and other purposes. Speaker, to the Acting Premier, does she agree with the PC plan to bring back passenger rail service? Here, 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 here. The Minister of Indigenous uh, Relations and Reconciliation. Sure, Thank you for that question. And and I do want to we'll wait till I acknowledge. Please carry on. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, people living in northern Ontario do have the right to rely on public transportation to travel between their communities, especially in those remote communities. They rely on that transportation for essential access to essential services. So what have we done? We are improving the intercommunity bus services in northern Ontario. And that's why just this past Friday we announced that we would work with existing private carriers to continue improving the intercommunity bus services. And what that has led to, Speaker, is that communities are going to benefit from that announcement. Those communities include Hearst, Horn Payne, White River, Red Lake, Emo, Rainy River, Fort Francis, Attaquokan, Red Rock, and other communities. Fantastic. We are going to provide the return service five days a week between all communities covered by the ONTC or private characters, thanks to this new funding. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the acting premier. While some northern Ontario Ontarians relied on the train for remote northern communities, including many First Nations, air travel is the only reliable year-round mode of transportation. This government has shown they do, do not care about the needs of northerners in many ways, including when they increased the aviation fuel tax by 148 per cent. As a direct result of this increase, Northerners have seen the cost of everything from food to fuel to personal travel for medical appointments go up. 
Our Ontario PC leader has recognized this issue and committed to reversing the 148 per cent increase to the aviation fuel tax for all northern airports, here, here. large and small. Will the Deputy Premier admit that this increase has created unnecessary hardship, hardships for Ontarians living in remote northern communities, Question. and will she agree to reverse this tax for northern Ontario? Here, here. Here, here. Minister. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the member knows, uh, aviation fuel tax was previously amended in 1992, and it was at 2 point cents a litre. The majority of aviation fuel is the federal tax, and uh, we have made it clear that the recent decrease in jet fuel prices, greater than 4 cents per litre, uh, increased in aviation fuel has been phased out between 2014 and 17. And as we know, what we're trying to do is ensure that we provide support for those municipalities and regions of the north to ensure that they get more funding, which these members on the other side have consistently uh, denied them. We have put forward increased funding for the OMPF and other support systems for the region. The aviation fuel tax is meant to provide even greater revenues for the communities, and the member opposite knows that the majority of that is federal government, and our proportionate amount is about one cent per litre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary, member from Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Acting Premier, investments in Northern Ontario will not be confined simply to bringing back the Northlander or reversing the aviation fuel tax. It's about economic development as well. The Ring of Fire is the single greatest opportunity economically that Northern Ontario has ever seen. It's estimated that it will create 5,500 5, sustainable jobs and increased increases of upwards of $2 billion in government re revenues. Under the People's Guarantee, Patrick Brown and the PC government will ensure that we are committed to building roads to the Ring of Fire. Since discovered, this government has done nothing but made broken promises and entered into bad faith negotiations with respect to the Ring. After 10 years since its discovery, construction of the roads are still not underway. In fact, the Ring of Fire isn't Question. even mentioned in the most recent fall economic statement. So, Mr. Speaker, to the Acting Premier, will this government finally admit that any reference they make to the Ring of Fire is nothing more Thank than you. an election? Thank you. Sir, Municipal Affairs, Mr. Speaker. Um, the member opposite missed the announcement in August of this year. The Premier is in Thunder Bay with the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, the Minister of Northern Development Mines, and myself as we made the announcement, followed through on our commitment. First Nations were in attendance with the, at the announcement at the same time, Speaker, and everybody is aware that they have signed on moving forward not only with one road, an east-west, but also with a north-south from the Kena, uh, Aroland area, straight north into Martin Falls as well. So a very exciting announcement. Speaker, it still remains surprising to me that members of the Conservative Party will stand in this place and pretend as best they are able that they will somehow provide more fiscal capacity for Northern Ontario municipalities when, in fact, they are the party, when in power, that downloaded massive amounts of financial responsibility onto the backs of residential property Answer. taxpayers, not only in Northern Ontario, but in every one of the 444 municipalities across this province. Thank you. <laughs> New question. The member from Comiskey, Cochrane. Thank you. My question is to the Acting Premier. Yesterday, we learned that a private gas plant in Brampton gained a Liberal government system for managing private electric contracts to the tune of $100 million. We know the company was fined for $10 million by the OEB for the fraud. And the Minister of Economic Development and Growth told reporters they had also paid back the full $100 million. But the amount paid back by the private gas plant is blacked out in the Ontario Energy Report. Wow. Will the Acting Premier tell us when the people of Ontario will be able to see for themselves that this private gas plant company has paid them back in full? Thank you. Thank you. The Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'll share with the member uh, some of the facts on this uh, as uh, as they've come forward, and some actually uh, reported today. In all, 92. Excuse me. Word and warnings. Thank you. Carry on. In all, the IESO negotiated 92 per cent of the costs uh, coming back. Uh, there, that includes the $10 million fine. 
Uh, the challenge here, Mr. Speaker, is some of these are disputed inappropriate costs that the company would take a different view on as to whether they were inappropriate or not. So there was a, uh, I could call it a negotiation between the IESO and the company to, to, to determine which of these it, it costs were, were really deemed to be ineligible. Uh, and uh, the fact that 92 yes, percent was recovered in the eyes of the IESO was deemed to be fair to the company, but more so fair to ratepayers. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the Acting Premier, if it's indeed true that the vast majority of these costs have been repaid by the company, can the Acting Premier tell us when the people will see that on their hydro bills? When will they be paid back for this fraud? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that, yes, indeed, uh, the 92 percent of the costs uh, uh, have been or the process of being paid back. I, I can't confirm that, indeed, that, uh, that those dollars have flowed yet, but they will. Uh, my understanding is they go right back into the IESO and the rate system, but uh, you'd have to uh, check with finance and our, our, uh, our accountants to determine exactly how that cash flow happens. But I, I appreciate the question. And, Certainly, uh, we may be able to uh, determine a more in-depth answer to you, but uh, with uh, in, in checking with our finance officials down the road. Answer. Thank you. Final supplementary. Ontario families and businesses are struggling under the weight of soaring hydro bills. Rates have gone up by 300 percent under this Liberal government, and now we learn that in addition to paying for the hydro they use, families were forced to pay $100 million to a ga private gas plant company for no reason at all. I'll ask the Acting Premier again, how will she ensure that the people of Ontario who pay those hydro bills get their money back? Minister. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, let's be very, very clear. Uh, uh, $100 million has not been lost. $100 million, in fact, has been Excuse me. Not 100 percent sure, so I'll just wait. Carry on. In addition, Mr. Speaker, the company that was accused of exploiting the process uh, has been fined at $10 million. So that money has flowed back into the system, Mr. Speaker. Ratepayers are not going to be out. Uh, the, uh, there, are, there is a dispute in terms of some of these costs. There's no question. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I think that speaks to the system, the definition of what appropriate costs ought to have been, and the ISO has, has strengthened that system as well to ensure that this can happen in the future. It's an unfortunate circumstance. Uh, they're Answer. still defending the company, Mr. Speaker, but at the end of the day, the ISO took the actions that it ought to have taken, and, uh, and ratepayers have been compensated, you. Mr. Speaker. New question. The member from Temiskamikaka. Once again to the Acting Premier. The OEB report on the newest gas plant scandal says that the team that monitors private electricity companies has been raising red flags about this kind of activity, activity for years. It points out that the Liberal government's loopholes have allowed private companies to take money from Ontario families and businesses with very few consequences. If the Liberal government knew about the $100 million fraud and the loopholes that let the private gas plant get away with stealing money for so long, why didn't anyone do anything about it until now? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Trade. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and the IESO is the organization, Mr. Speaker, that administers these matters and deals with these matters, Mr. Speaker. It's not the minister or the government that engages in these kinds of discussions and these kinds of negotiations with, with, with these companies, nor do, they, nor do we do the procurement. It's, it's the uh, it's the ISO that does that. Uh, they, they identified that there was an issue going on. They investigated the issue. The issue did take some time. It was apparently very complex and difficult to determine. Uh, at the end of the day, they determined that there were some ineligible costs that were claimed by this company and a few others, Mr. Speaker, uh, and they took the action to recover the vast majority of the funds that had been deemed to be ineligible claims, uh, and they fined this company $10 million in addition to that. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I believe they've taken the action they ought to have taken, yes, sir. Uh, and uh, certainly at the surface, it seems like it's a pretty fair result. Thank you. Supplementary. This is a long-standing issue. The Brampton gas plant alone was able to defraud the people of this province for almost three years Shame. before it was discovered. 
The OAB report says, and I quote, the systems that are in place have created opportunities for exploitation to the serious financial disadvantage of Ontario ratepayers. Why has this Liberal government allowed private energy companies to exploit the people of Ontario for so long? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, once again, let me, let me repeat. Uh, the ISO has recovered the vast majority of the funds that were in dispute uh, and indeed levied a fine to the company in question. Uh, so the ratepayers are not out here, Mr. Speaker, uh, for the vast majority of those ineligible funds. So, so that's, I think, point number one. Point number two. When something like this occurs, it does mean that there must have been some kind of a problem or a flaw with the system that was in place. In this, in this case, it would appear that the definition of eligible uh, costs were probably not clear enough. And the ISO has taken measures to correct that, Mr. Speaker, which is the appropriate course of action for, for them to take. So the dollars have been recovered. The ISO has taken appropriate action to ensure this doesn't happen in the future. And indeed, Mr. Speaker, a market renewable systems being put into place where this will never, ever happen in the future. Two. Final supplementary. This is not an isolated incident. There is a systemic issue with how this government allows private energy companies to operate in Ontario. The government knew about this fraud and they did nothing for years. The OEB report went on to say that, and I quote, the panel, was frequent, the panel has frequently commented on the substantial inefficiencies and opportunities for exploitation that are associated with different elements of the design of the wholesale electrically, electricity market. You knew about it. You did nothing. I'll ask the acting premier again. Why has her government allowed the people of Ontario to foot the bill for the shenanigans of private energy companies for so long. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have to correct the member again. Uh, it, the, uh, the funds that, were, that are in question have, for the most part, been recovered. Uh, so uh, when he says foot the bill, uh, indeed, the OAS, OE, ISO has recovered the vast majority of the funds and levied a $10 million fine to the company. There's no defending the, a company that exploited this system, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, we need to ensure, and the ISO is very aware of this, that they need to be more vigilant, Mr. Speaker, in their systems when they put those systems in place to ensure that there is clarity in what eligible costs ought to be or ought not to be, Mr. Speaker. They've made the changes they need to make to that system. I think that's what Ontario ratepayers would expect of them. They've recovered the vast majority of funds on behalf of Ontario ratepayers. I think Ontario ratepayers would expect that as well. And they've leveled a ten, to, levied a $10 yes, million dollar fine, the largest ever, Mr. Speaker, on, on that company. I think Ontario ratepayers would expect that as well. What can we do? Thank you. New question. Oh. Member from Huron Bruce. Thank you very much, Speaker. To the Deputy Premier. Speaker, the Russian Olympic team were not the only folks to receive a ban yesterday. Last night, CTV London reported that the Port Albert General Store is closing this winter for the first time in 150 years. Oh, no. Oh, no. A direct result of this government's bad policies. Six employees will be out of work this winter just before Christmas. When it reopens this spring, Speaker, the Deputy Premier, a summer client, will no longer be welcomed there. Oh. Can the Deputy Premier explain to the House why she has been banned from the Port Albert General Store and tell us how many other Liberal Caucus members have been banned from small businesses throughout the province oh. because of their bad decisions? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. But to the Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Speaker, perhaps the member opposite could explain when you had the chance to stand up for working people Chair, in please. the province of Ontario. Speaker, you turned your backs on. Member from Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington is warned. And I'll wait for the others. If you'd like to add. To the chair, please. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, a third of people in the province of Ontario currently make less than $15 an hour. Half of those people, more than half of those people, Speaker, are between the ages of 25 and 64. That's the time when they're trying to raise families, pay rent, 
buy clothes for the kids, put the kids through school, put food on the table, Speaker. This party opposite has denied these families the opportunity to do that, and now they pull out a gimmicky question like this, Speaker. Speaker, we all had an opportunity yes, to stand up for working people in Ontario. Right. These guys turned their backs on them, Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Be seated. Minister of, the Minister of Infrastructure is warned. Supplementary. Speaker, again, back to the Deputy Premier. This party, this government just doesn't get it because these six people will be earning zero dollars yeah. per hour zero. because they're zero. losing their income through zero. the winter months Drew because Ontario. this owner has no other options but to close. And, Speaker, Drew I am Ontario. sure this is just one example of many more to come. Rural and the Ontario. people's guarantee we will still move forward with minimum wage increases just more slowly. This is an approach that the Ontario Chamber of Commerce said would mitigate job impacts by 74 per cent. So, Speaker, will the Deputy Premier sign on to the People's Guarantee and help us fix the mess that her government has made and save jobs and small businesses throughout Ontario? Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? Thank you. The member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex is warned. If you all want to get the last word, I do. A little louder, and I'll warn you. Minister? Speaker, quite the contrary to what the member is asserting, when the opportunity was given to this House to support working people. The member from Huron Bruce is warned. Carry on. Thank you, Speaker. To support working people in the province of Ontario, these guys refuse to stand up and be counted, Speaker. The Ontario economy is leading the G7 in economic growth. We've got unemployment numbers so low, Speaker that we haven't seen in decades, Speaker. The Ontario economy is doing well, Speaker, and when this party had an opportunity to vote just last week, they voted against paid sick days for Ontario workers. Wow. They voted against child death leave, crime-related leave, disappearance leave, yeah. pregnancy leave, yeah. domestic violence and sexual violence leave, Speaker. Oh these, had a, these folks had an opportunity to stand up for working people in the province of Ontario Member from the PN Carleton is warned. I'll do this all morning if you like. Carry on. Speaker, and then they put out the glossy magazine Answer. that tells us they've lost $12 billion in costs. They don't know what to do to it, Speaker. Then they tell us we're, they're going to roll Thank back you. the minimum wage, Speaker. Material workers are starting. Thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Can you see that, please? You see that, please? New question. The member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. Yesterday, a publicly owned Niagara on the Lake Hydro issue a simple and straightforward request. Keep your political message off our residents' bill. Nobody likes to receive a bill. But right now, the Ontario Energy Board forces local distributors to print local messages on their bill. They're forcing utilities to include lines that refer to savings from their hydro scheme, savings that aren't actually there. The so-called savings this government is forcing them to print is nothing more than costs they kick down the road, a plan which won't lower bills and won't bring hydro back into public hands. My question is simple, Mr. Speaker. Local distributors are asking the Liberals to stop forcing them to produce bills that can't, they contain their political advertising for a plan they don't believe is actually creating savings. Will the Acting Premier listen to local distributors? To the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Of Economic Development and Growth. 
Speaker, I think the only people in this province that don't want rate payers to know they're getting a 25 per cent cut on their energy rates are the NDP and maybe the PCs, Mr. Speaker. So I understand why the member would be upset that, that uh, rate payers are being informed that their bills are going down by 25 per cent. Mr. Speaker, this government doesn't design the energy bills. In fact, We've, we've heard, and, and I'm, I'm sitting beside a previous energy minister, we've heard time and time again from ratepayers, Mr. Speaker, that they want to see ways to ensure that the bills are easier for ratepayers to understand. That's what the OEB is looking at, Mr. Speaker, on behalf of ratepayers. I think they're doing some good work in that respect, but I do understand why the member wouldn't want them to be aware of their 25 per cent uh, cut to their energy rates, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Two supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the Acting Premier. Let me quote Jim Ryan, the chair of the publicly owned Niagara Lake Hydro Utility. He said, putting political messages on invoices is simply wrong. And frankly, we agree with him. Keep your polit political spin off our people's hydro bills. Residents, to answer his response, residents are smart enough to know that if their bills have gone up 300%, they aren't seeing savings no matter how many times you write it on their bill. Will the acting premier stop insulting people whose bills have skyrocketed because of bad decision and remove and remove the political messaging from the people's hydro bills as requested by local distributors? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are no political messages on the bills at all, Mr. Speaker. Informing, informing ratepayers that they're getting 25 per cent off their energy costs is information, information that they deserve to have in spite of the efforts of the NDP to, to ensure that they don't know that they're getting 25 per cent off. Why would the member not want his constituents to know, Mr. Speaker, that their energy rates have gone down by 25 per cent? The only reason I can think of, Mr. Speaker, is a political reason on their part that they don't want their members to know that we've brought energy rates down in the province province of Ontario by 25 per cent. We're very proud of that. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, he ought to let his constituents know uh, that we've also built a clean, reliable and affordable energy system in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, it hasn't been easy. It's Answer. taken a lot of investment. It's taken a lot of time. But, Mr. Speaker, Ontarians have a clean, reliable, affordable energy system that they can be proud of. Thank you. Speaker. Question the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Status of Women. Today is a day of national remembrance and action on violence against women. It is an emotional day for women and Canadians across the country who remember with great sadness the events of December 6, 1989. We will hold an annual commemorative event in my riding of Kingston and the Islands at Sydenham United Street Church, organized by Lee Martins, and I thank her for her efforts. On December 6, 1989, 14 young women were murdered at L'Ecole Polytechnic in Montreal. They were young women, engineers, and their lives were cut short by a senseless act of misogyny by a man who said he wanted to kill feminists. Minister, can you tell me what this province is doing to challenge every day the deeply rooted attitudes that lead to violence against women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for this very important question. Speaker, 28 years have passed, but we will never forget what happened to those 14 young women and to the women and girls who have suffered violence in this province. As the Minister of the Status of Women, it is my priority to ensure that women and girls feel safe in this province and to help build a society where women can live free from the fear or threat of violence. But, Mr. Speaker, the harsh reality is that 83 per cent of domestic violence victims are women. The reality is that women are four times more likely to be victims of homicide. The reality is that one in three women will experience some form of sexual violence or harassment in their lives. Speaker, that is why we are working tirelessly to improve the province's response to domestic violence and to create a gender-based violence strategy. Answer. Our strategy will integrate the Sexual Violence and Harassment Action Plan, Ending Violence Against Indigenous Women Plan, our Human Trafficking Initiatives, and update the Domestic Thank Violence you. Plan. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for her answer, and the statistics are truly alarming. 
My colleague is right. We need to take action to change attitude and perspectives on gender violence because this affects us all. Speaker, hashtags like Me Too have shone a light on how prevalent sexual violence and harassment are in our homes, our workplaces, and our communities. Women are showing enormous courage and strength by speaking out, and we need to make sure they know we are listening. Gender-based based violence impacts not only survivors, but their families, their workplaces, their communities, and their relationships forever. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please outline specific new policies Question. that address the needs of survivors of violence and their families in our communities Thank across you, this minister. province? Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Kingston and the Islands. Speaker, I'm pleased to speak about the cross-government supports we are providing to Ontario women, and here's what we're doing. Speaker, working with the Ministry of Labour, we will be providing paid leave for survivors of domestic and sexual violence. This means a survivor can keep their job and escape a violent and abusive relationship to seek support and safety for themselves and their families. And with the Ministry of Housing, we are helping survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking trafficking escape violent situations by providing faster access to housing through our portable housing benefit. These survivors will receive priority access to income-based social housing. Speaker, I'm also pleased to report that frontline workers in the hospitality, health, education and community services sector are now able to access training to help them recognize and respond to sexual Answer. violence and harassment on the job. It's part of It's Your Shift. Speaker, we're working hard to build a future free from the threat or fear of violence for women. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. Uh, speaker, last week saw another tragic crash on Highway 401 in my riding that left uh, two people dead and four injured. Mayors in Leeds Grenville took their concerns about highway safety to the Minister way back in March after a, a horrific fatal collision involving a hazardous chemical. They demanded action to make the highway safer and protect motorists and first responders and the minister ignored them for six months. Here's how Prescott Mayor Brett Todd described the ministry's response. We waited six months to get the first meeting. We lost a great deal of time. Speaker, the minister is meeting with these frustrated mayors on December 15th. Having wasted so much time spinning his wheels, what measures will he announce to end the carnage on our highways? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Um, Speaker, thanks very much. I uh, want to thank the member for his question. I've of course, I've said many times uh, in this chamber that whenever we have uh, any injury, in particular any fatality on a highway anywhere in the province, uh, it is something that the ministry obviously takes very seriously, and our condolences go out to the families of the loved ones that are involved. I have had the opportunity, and the member from Leeds Grenville would know this, he and I have actually specifically chatted. He's come to see me about this particular challenge that uh, municipal leaders and the travelling public in eastern Ontario are facing. The member did neglect to mention I've already had one in-person meeting in oh, Kingston with his mayor and a collection of other mayors from Eastern Ontario. It took place a number of weeks ago. I found it to be a very productive meeting. Uh, I heard a variety of, uh, of, of opinions and input provided by the mayors from Eastern Ontario. Uh, I think that they felt that that first meeting that took place weeks ago was a worthwhile meeting and a very, set a very solid foundation for how we intend to move forward. And as I committed to at that meeting that took place weeks ago, I expect Thank we'll you. have an update in the next number of days uh, to provide to the Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Um, I want to remind the minister that uh, the mayors aren't coming to the table just to hear him talk. The only commitment this minister has made is that widening, widening the increasingly congested highway to six lanes we need isn't happening. Despite the dangerous conditions, he says Eastern Ontario can wait. Let me tell the minister that's unacceptable, and we need to hear real solutions. Since May, there have been 16 people killed and 18 people injured in a dozen crashes on the 401 between Trenton and Cornwall. Speaker, the snow is flying, and the busy holiday travel season is upon us. Again, my question, why did the minister waste so much time, and what measures is he going to announce to make Eastern Ontario highways safer and save lives. Thank you, Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, thanks very much. Uh, you know, as I said in the uh, in the first answer to this member, we at the ministry, I specifically take this uh, this area of responsibility extremely seriously. I have said on many occasions. The safety of our roads and highways, from my perspective, is not meant to be, nor should it ever be, a partisan issue. Speaker, I have to say, I have to say, despite my best efforts to convey that message not only to that member and to his leader and to their team, and also to our municipal partners, it is borderline shameful that this member would stand and try to take some sort of partisan jab over an issue that is extremely important to me, to the ministry, to the traveling public, and ultimately to his constituents. The member from Niagara West Glanbrook is warned. Carry on. Thanks, Speaker, as I was saying, as members in this House know, for the last 16 consecutive years, Answer. the province of Ontario has ranked first or second across North America for road and highway safety. It will be my pleasure to continue to work with Mayor Todd and the rest of the Eastern Region Mayors and the OPP Thank and you. the Ministry to make sure that we get this right. Thank you very much. Your question, the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. To the Acting Premier. Yesterday, I rose in this House to talk about a man named Essa who died trying to escape the horrific conditions in an unlicensed group home. Essa paid the landlord almost $4,000 for one month in that mouth mouse infested basement where he frequently was locked inside. Wow. Sadly, as the situation is not unique, you can see the cockroaches swarming almost like a moving carpet, one, one man said of his time in an illegal home. Countless other residents have reported unsanitary linens, overcrowding, and going days without food. My colleague from Welland introduced Bill 135 in May, which would establish a framework for the licensing of these homes. If the government is not willing to create more spaces in long-term care and affordable, accessible Question. housing, then the very least they could do is establish a framework for licensing. Is this Liberal government willing to make the commitment today, pass Bill 135, Thank and you. license and regulate these group homes? Deputy to the Minister of Health. Minister of Health, long-term care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to uh, speak to this important question, and, and I share the concern that's raised by uh, the member opposite uh, that this uh, that these these stories uh, from individuals who rely on their uh, these environments, care homes, group homes, to provide the necessary supports, to provide a, uh, an environment which is conducive to their. Uh, um, getting well and staying well, Mr. Speaker, that these reports are definitely troubling. So that's why, uh, as a result, and I think the member understands that, this, it, that there are a variety of individuals who may avail themselves of these types of residences, so this is necessarily a, uh, an effort that requires work across ministries, but I've asked my ministry to take the lead to look at the situation in care homes and group homes, uh, right, particularly uh, those uh, where we find vulnerable individuals, and to uh, interact with stakeholders and clients and residents themselves to find out what more can Thank be you. Done. Supplementary. Back to the Acting Premier. We finally know who is responsible for this issue, the Minister of Health, who yesterday said that it was a cross-ministry issue, meaning that the people who have lived and died in these horrendous conditions should look to all the ministries that have failed them. The Ministry of Health has failed to ensure there are enough long-term care beds, mental health supports and housing for people leaving hospitals. The Ministry of Community and Social Services has failed people with developmental disabilities who face decade-long wait lists for housing. The Ministry of Seniors Affairs has failed to address dire issues of seniors living in poverty. The Ministry of Housing and Poverty Reduction Strategy has failed to provide support to municipalities to crack down on these unlicensed homes with numerous safety violations. Saying that this is a complex, multi-ministerial issue does not excuse this Liberal government for ignoring this problem for years. Question. Will we get a commitment for immediate action today so that nobody else has to live or die in these horrendous conditions? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite surely knows that municipalities have oversight. They have the regulatory ability to, to pass bylaws, and many, if not most of them, do. And I know she's heckling right now. This is a very serious issue, and we're taking it seriously, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but there is no government before this government that has stood up for and created stronger regulatory environments for long-term care homes, Mr. Speaker. We strengthened oversight and responsibility for child care, for day care, for retirement homes, which were completely, uh, all of those were completely unlicensed under an NDP government, Mr. Speaker, and unregulated. So we have provided the strongest regulatory environment, environment for these facilities in the history of Ontario, and I have committed to have my ministry take the lead to look at group homes and care homes, Mr. Mr. Speaker, which contain a variety of individuals under municipal Answer. oversight, and we'll look at it with stakeholders, with residents, to see what might be done, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. New question. All right, we have a new question. The member from Carleton, Mississippi Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Housing. Eli Sagbini is a landlord who is suffering the unfairness of the Landlord and Tenant Board and the rules which heavily favour the tenant. Eli had a tenant who did not pay the rent on August 1st. He filed the Landlord and Tenant Board N4 form on August 2nd, the Landlord and Tenant Board L1 form on August 16th, went to a Landlord and Tenant Board hearing on September 18th got an eviction notice for September 30th and called the sheriff on October 2nd to post an eviction notice on the tenant's door to leave by October 12th. The tenant left, two and a half months had passed, and Eli is out of pocket $4,000 plus costs. This isn't fair. Minister, Question. can you help Eli by restoring fairness for him and all landlords? Thank you, Minister of Housing and Poverty. Reduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Carleton, Mississippi Mills, for the question. And I want to express uh, empathy towards Eli Sagabini uh, and to reassure that uh, we understand uh, their concerns and that there are protections in place for situations like these. Uh, small landlords have a critical role to play in providing housing throughout the province, yeah, yeah. and we know that the vast majority of landlords are fair and reasonable and uh, are hardworking. The RTA, uh, which came into effect in January 2007, lays out the legal framework for governing landlord-tenant relationships in Ontario, and it also created the Landlord and Tenant Board. And we're proud that the Landlord Tenant Board is able to answer approximately half a million calls per year from tenants and landlords and process about 80,000 applications per year. Tenants and landlords may apply to the LTB uh, as well as go to small claims yes, court to resolve disputes. And we're committed to supporting this cooperative system that helps both landlords and tenants. Mr. Thank Speaker. you. Supplementary. To the Minister of Housing again. Eli Sagbini is a small businessman who is struggling to cope with the landlord-tenant rules that are not fair to landlords. Eli offers the following suggestions for changes. Number one, create a problem tenant directory. Number two, allow landlords to collect a damaged deposit. Number three, shorten the time for the N4 form notice of application from two weeks to one day. Number four, shorten the time for the L1 form application to the hearing from four weeks to one week. And number five, reduce the landlord application fee from $190 to $50, the same as the tenant. These changes would create fairness for landlords Question. and tenants. Minister, will you make these changes? Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to uh, assure the House that uh, we're committed to ensuring that landlords and tenants are always protected under the law. And this government also knows that small business people have so much to offer this province, and we understand the pressures that uh, are sometimes put on them. So, Mr. Speaker, I note the member has listed a number of uh, suggestions uh, that he has, but I want to uh, remind the House that before a tenancy starts under the uh, 
Residential Tenancy Act. It allows landlords to do the due diligence, to do credit checks, uh, check on past rental history, uh, references, guarantees, and uh, with the human rights. Uh, comply with the Ontario Human Rights uh, Code when they ask these questions. Landlords do have the opportunity to do this due diligence, and we maintain that uh, by yes, doing sir. this, uh, landlords can protect themselves. It provides for a fast-track uh, eviction process. It allows landlords to evict when deliberate damage is Thank done you. to a unit, and it protects other— Thank you. Your question, the member from Barrie. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. There's a lot going on with the global economy and a lot of uncertainty. It appears that here we can be confident that Ontario's economy is headed in the right direction. Parents in my community want to know that their kids are going to have access to employment. Workers want to know that their jobs are safe for the foreseeable future, and business owners want to know that Ontario is a good place to invest and grow a business. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the people and families in my riding of Barrie of just how strong our economy is today. Can the minister please Can the minister please provide an update on Ontario's economic progress in light of this month's job numbers? Thank you. Ignorant. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm delighted to inform the member that this past month we've seen a record amount of job growth in Ontario. We're up 43,500 net new jobs in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That is the largest increase since February 2008, before the global recession. We also passed another milestone last Friday, Mr. Speaker. We've now created over 800,000 net new jobs since the global recession. More accurately, that's 843,000. 200 net new jobs. We continue to lead the country in growth, the G7 in growth. Our unemployment rate also hit a new low, Mr. Speaker, at 5.5 per cent. That's the lowest unemployment rate we've seen in 17 and a half years in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, there's every reason to be confident that Ontario's economy is doing well today, and we're headed in the right direction, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for that answer. This is great news for the families all across Ontario. There's no question that our investments in people and infrastructure and our business growth initiatives are paying off for the people of this province. There's no question that this economy is doing extremely well. This is shown again by the fantastic job numbers this month. 43,500 net new jobs in one month is remarkable along with the lowest unemployment rate in 17 and a half years at 5.5 percent. In fact, last year in my riding of Barrie, unemployment was the highest in the province at 7.9 percent. Now it is at 3.4 percent, the lowest, the lowest in the province and second lowest in the country. That translates to over 17,000 jobs in my hometown of Barrie in the last year alone. Question. However, Speaker, there are uncertainties today in the global economy, whether it's NAFTA, Brexit, or emerging technology. Can the minister outline to this House what risks exist for our economy going into— Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is in a position of strength, and being in a position of strength means that if we stay the course, Mr. Speaker, we can withstand any risks that emerge in the changing global economy, be it risks from NAFTA or emerging technologies or any other types of global change. We've also stepped up when it comes to the new economy, Mr. Speaker. We want to ensure that we're at the cutting edge of technological development. I'd say, Mr. Speaker, today that Ontario is not only a leader in economic growth for today's economy, we're going to be a leader in economic growth for many decades ahead, Mr. Speaker, which means we will be able to pass on to our next generation an economy, Mr. Speaker, that we can be proud to pass on to them, that comes with the opportunities that many of us have had in the past, maybe even greater opportunities, Mr. Yes, Speaker. That would not be happening, Mr. Speaker, without the investments we've made in our people, our talent and innovation, Mr. Speaker, and in Thank in you. infrastructure. Thank you. Any questions? The member from, the member from Halliburton, Portha Lake Sprock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Ten months ago, a group home in Oakwood in my riding burned to the ground, killing two people, including one child. 
This sad incident highlighted many flaws in our province's management of group homes. This past week, we saw a disturbing article in the Toronto Star about the abuse and violence faced by group home staff, as well as the lack of training and oversight by the ministry. As a member of the government's panel reviewing residential care system put it, you know your system is based on the flimsiest of foundations when you have absolutely no standards on who can do this work. The Ontario Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth had previously said he is fed up with the situation, but we have seen little action from this government. Why is the government allowing our children and care workers Question. to live in such terrible conditions? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member opposite uh, for the question. Uh, the events that took place in her riding uh, were very tragic, and um, you know my heart goes out to uh, to everyone who is involved, the workers, the family, the community as a whole. Um, the experiences shared by the group home workers and with uh, with the Toronto Star, um, I know it was a very difficult article for many to read. I wanted to uh, take a moment just to acknowledge the uh, bravery. Uh, in the uh, folks to sharing their stories uh, that were captured uh, in that article. Um, service providers and workers play an important role in the lives of young people in care, and they have a strong influence in the day-to-day -day lives of young people um, who are in uh, their care. Immediately following the fire, uh, multiple investigations were started by local and provincial authorities, some which are continuing, Mr. Speaker, and the ministry continues to offer its full support and in those investigations. Uh, the places that children and youth live in must be welcoming and they must meet their needs. And we're doing uh, work reform to uh, ensure we better position young people Thank for you. success. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, the government needs to start treating uh, our group home workers and high needs children like people, not statistics. I had written to the minister about the tragic state of our group homes this past April. I even filed an order paper question to see if I could get some real answers from this government. Unfortunately, the Toronto Star article shows that this government just isn't listening. First, they failed to implement key recommendations from the Residential Services Review Panel to create a single oversight body for the system, even though they could have included that in Bill 89. Now we learn that even when my local Children's Aid Society tried to reach out to the ministry to address an increase in violence, quote, there was silence. Oh dear. Will the minister stop ignoring these calls for action and take this issue with the seriousness that it deserves? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've taken immediate, ac immediate action to address some of the issues the member is raising. We increased the number of uh, unannounced uh, inspections of licensed residents. We've confirmed licensed res residents. Uh, are compliant with the current fi fire code, and we established an intensive site review team to conduct enhanced um, inspections of the sites, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the interesting thing about this question, I don't, I don't want to make this, qu this question a, a contentious back and forth, but we put forward a whole new framework for residential services for young people, um, and we put forward a blueprint. In Bill 89, we've modernized many of the aspects that uh, we're talking about today, and still, we don't know why the Conservative Party voted against Bill 89, which modernized services uh, for children in this province. So I, I still yes, have to ask, why, why didn't we have cooperation from the Conservative Party? Thank you. Stop for a um, Teachable moment. Exactly why you're supposed to speak to the chairs when I stand. If you're speaking to the chair, you'll know I was standing. And I also, would you like me to interject? Also, the interjections were not helpful either. New question. A member from Windsor Tecumseh. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Good morning. Seven months ago, I had a private member's bill pass second reading. It called for a change in the law to allow Canadian Club whiskey to be sold where it's been made in Windsor for the past 130 years. And Speaker, you may recall that the owners of Hiram Walker sold the Canadian Club brand, but it's still made under contract by the same people in the same place. 
Red tape and the current regulations don't allow whiskey bottled under contract to be sold where it's produced. I've been told Liberal senior policy advisors claim changing the law might impact international trade policies. Speaker, could someone over there point me to the exact language or clause in some agreement that states the simple change is just too much work for Question. Liberals to undertake? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question from the member opposite, who's been advocating strongly for his community to maintain the uh, the Heritage Centre uh, uh, for uh, Canadian Club Heritage Centre open, recognizing uh, how important it is for tourism and and his community. And I applaud you for the tremendous work you're doing. He also recognizes that the private member's bill is before the committee, and there are some uh, elements of the bill that would uh, cause. Uh, precedents in respect to selling liquor and alcohol outside of an LCBO store. Recognizing that, we have made and tried to accommodate uh, the new owners of Canadian Club who have yet to state that they will in fact maintain it open even after we put forward this issue, but I welcome and I can talk more about this in supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Canadian Club Heritage Brand Centre, as the minister has referenced, is a palatial building one of the most significant in Ontario, if not North America. 15,000 people a year used to tour the building every year. It's Windsor's second most uh, visited, most popular tourist attraction after Caesars. It's been closed since March, since this issue erupted. Why won't the Liberals pull out all the stops, put on their thinking caps, and find a solution so that the bottling of whiskey can be sold, or a few bottles of whiskey can be sold after a tour, and the doors to the brand center can reopen to the public. Thank you, Minister. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, as a member also knows, uh, we do offer some of those privileges when it's being produced within those locations. That's not the case here. And the member opposite, I know, doesn't want unintended consequences in regards to social responsibility and other measures. And again the owners of the Heritage Centre hasn't yet even requested this. I know the member wants it, and so do I. But the owners have not stood up, and the owners are not guaranteeing that they'll maintain it open, even after we put this forward. And the precedent it would set would be precarious right across the province. I know the member doesn't want that, but I do feel for his need, and I would like to see a solution in that respect, too. Thank you. New question, the member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, providing Ontarians with timely access to the care they need, whether at home, in the community, or one of our many institutions, community and our outstanding hospitals is of the utmost importance to our government. Over the past 14 years, our health system has improved significantly. We've increased our investment in health care each and every year, allowing us to treat more patients and provide better care, reduce wait times to some of the shortest in the country. Our government has increased funding for health care by $23 billion since 2003, and in our most recent budget, we announced an additional $9 billion to support hospital construction projects across the province. To today, across Ontario, there are 34 major hospital projects underway that will provide additional capacity, state-of-the-art facilities for people across the province, including planning for a major rebuild for Michael Sharon Hospital in my riding of Beaches East York. Will the Minister of Health, Long-Term Care, please inform the House of the great news he shared with surgeons at Toronto Western thank Hospital? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, in the last few days, we've had two great uh, hospital-related announcements. On Friday, I had the honour of being in Windsor, and in fact, I have to give a shout-out to the three uh, Windsor and Essex uh, MPPs because we announced a brand new a multi-billion dollar hospital for Windsor and Essex, state-of-the-art, that's going to be providing the absolute highest quality of care to the residents of both Windsor County and Essex County. And of course, yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I was at Toronto Western uh, Hospital here in Toronto with the member from Trinity Spadina to announce an investment uh, in the order of $100 million to completely renew and renovate and expand the operating theatres, the surgical suites at Toronto Western Hospital, a hospital that we all know is, is so well known for their advanced uh, uh, care 
training and capacity Answer. in areas like neurosurgery and many other uh, surgical specialties. So a uh, big shout out to the people of Toronto Western, an important investment that will uh, enable those doctors, surgeons and Thank their teams you. do even better. Excellent. Time for question period is over. The Minister of Education on a point of order. Thank you. Speaker, it is my pleasure today to welcome some very special guests uh, to Queen's Park, the Ontario Principals Council and President Mary Linton, as well as Alison Otten, Executive Director. Please welcome them as they visit with us today. Thank you. I beg to inform the House that the following document was tabled. The 2017 Annual Report from the Office of the Auditor General of Ontario. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>